Welcome to the Stratcom podcast series. I'm Ahmad Kaplan. I'm a presenter at TRT World. I host a show called Double Check. Today, we'll be talking about disinformation and crisis. Joining me is Wasim Khalid, who is the CEO and co-founder of Blackbird.ai. And he's consulted and advised government agencies and companies around the world on the dangers and countermeasures of the escalating information warfare arms race. Wasim, thanks for joining us. Can we just start with that? What is the escalating information warfare arms race? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I guess a lot of people think about information operations and things of that nature through the lens of placeholder buckets like fake news and disinformation. But all of these things are like a, almost like a placeholder term for a variety of pretty systemic issues. So important to point out that the real issue here isn't just uh, fake news or disinformation, but it's the, the manipulation of narrative, uh, manipulation of, of public perception through coordinated, inauthentic behavior that has become a pretty uh, sophisticated tradecraft. And uh, what tends to occur is um, there are a lot of hot button issues and topics that, um, that are designed to polarize people and organizations against one another. And so a lot of what we've studied and looked at is how online actors manipulate information streams to shift public perception and to drive human behaviors. And the issues that we all have to look at today as communicators and just uh, human beings living in an information-driven world is, is when our um, attentions and our motivations are, are, are being manipulated by outside actors. And so it very much is this notion of manipulation of human perception and reactions to what we see and what we perceive the world to be through the lens of disinformation actors and, uh, and online manipulators. And that relates to the work you do at the company you co-founded, Blackbird.ai. Can you talk about what projects you're involved in, what type of work you're doing with the company? Yeah, sure. So at Blackbird, we analyze disinformation and narrative manipulation with an AI-driven engine. Uh, and the work we do is primarily with communications firms, PR firms, crisis management, uh, Fortune 500s, and national security. Uh, and the work is essentially really touching upon every category that is, uh, I suppose, that drives <laughs> commerce and, and societies, really. It's uh, it's the financial sectors, it's healthcare, it's, it's government, uh, you know, cohesion, technology companies that, that, that drive how we communicate. So um, we help a lot of these organizations with risk intelligence and with understanding what information is authentic and what is inauthentic and helping them then um, almost acting like a firewall for this kind of bad information they want to make sure doesn't uh, drive harm to their customers, to their constituents, or to their online systems. Just so we have some context, can you give a, a real-life example of a, a certain company, let's say, that you know sells goods? Can you just explain how you would give them the authentic information? Yeah, sure. You know, all of our, our clients are, are somewhat have confidentiality with us, but I can give you a pretty good example. So let's say that, you know, something pops up on social media um, and it could be a, a real human being that posted it, or it could be maybe planted by a, you know, disinformation as the service actor, right? It doesn't really matter that very first post, but let's say that's tweet zero, right? Um, that can then be harnessed, right? Particularly if it's like a provocative or polarizing statement, say company X is greenwashing. Uh, and for those that aren't familiar, greenwashing is a term that means uh, you're making something appear more sustainable than it is. Um, so mm -hmm. big topics today around environmental, sustainable uh, governance, ESG category, this, is, this becomes an issue. So um, that narrative, that post could be taken by an adversary or by a competitor or, or a shareholder activist, someone who owns shares and want to kind of manipulate the company to their benefit. Um, they can use amplifier accounts. They can amplify that narrative and start to expand on it, make it sound like it's becoming a bigger and bigger snowballing problem. Uh, perhaps it's a, 
uh, what's called a sock puppet, which is one human controlling maybe tens of thousands of online accounts, operating a bot network to make it seem like there's traction and risk spinning up around this topic. Now, suddenly this one grievance, particularly if it's left by a real human, um, is taken and made much larger in the media space. So this is media manipulation uh, in practice. Um, and it's pushed into what we call uh, coalitions, it's a, a grouping, a tribal affinity group. They could be anti-vaxxers. They could be whatever group has similar interests and want to drive similar narratives. And so those coalitions could be almost targeted with that harmful narrative that the threat actor is trying to spread. Um, and those coalitions typically already have their sights set on attacking a particular sector let's say the energy sector. So the movement is now primed online by the individuals who are manipulating that seed narrative. And when this starts to snowball, you can see this move between platforms, say between Reddit and Twitter, or between a fringe network um, and other platforms, before ultimately it ends up on the mainstream news media, which are themselves mining social media for high traction, trending, uh, items and stories. So the problem here is you get this feedback that feeds back into itself. And I think one of the most alarming things that decision makers haven't fully realized yet is that real life, as it were, um, in, in a post-COVID Zoom world, I suppose, the real world is downstream of digital media and the digital landscape. And then you get this feedback loop and now your company your organization, your executive, your policy, whatever, whatever that tweet zero narrative was about is firmly in the spotlight and firmly in the crosshairs of anybody else that might want to jump onto this issue. And uh, I think decision makers and policymakers have to think about the world in that lens and understand that they have to have much more resolution around this kind of manipulation to have any chance of making critical decisions that are uh, well-informed and, uh, and driven through true situational awareness. Wasim, can you also talk about some of these actors who are trying to manipulate information and the proponents of uh, disinformation? So what's to gain for, for these types of actors? I mean, is it purely monetary-based gain that they're after? Actors um, that are online involved in this kind of work have, uh, you know, many different motivations. I tend to think about this problem for the, from the perspective of kind of rapid detection within data, right? That's just my approach in these mostly anonymous environments. But I think the thing we, we think about here is you got your profiteers and scammers. So we see a lot of this around cryptocurrency uh, snake oil style COVID cures. So this is a category for people who are, are making pure money off of selling something. And, and there's, a, there's something to that. There's um, a whole additional group that, are, that have much bigger stakes in what we see around like, things like Wall Street bets and market manipulation. You know, frankly, insider trading has some pretty big uh, penalties to it, but manipulating social media and shorting a stock is fairly undetectable. So certainly less risk associated with that. Um, and, and so we see a lot of people out there manipulating uh, social media for, for gains in the stock market, right? But then there's also disinformation as industrial espionage, right? And, and this is the one that I think corporations really need to get their heads around. It's happening right now. Um, so disinformation is a service where firms are hired to negatively impact competitors, to support um, organizational goals for their own companies, this is something that will only become more prevalent. And so um, I think those are the ones that um, at least communicators really need to worry about. I think, of course, the other category is there are some people who just want to watch the world burn, right? So you do have these fringe networks and decentralized groups of individuals that just want to create some chaos. Um, and, and there's always been that group as well. And it just so happens that right now, social media and the current environment has created an environment where they can all kind of play off of one another and amplify one another and kind of get their own intentions and motivations fulfilled. Um, and this makes it much more perilous to any entity that is trying to control their own message, their brand, and, uh, and protect their assets. 
And can you, Wasm, just explain the artificial intelligence element to all of this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at least at Blackbird, we are a uh, an AI and technology company, um, and we are a, a software platform. And so there are a lot of cyber companies out there who um, have been looking at these problems through different lenses through analysts, right? But the problem is that uh, this is not a, a scalable way to deal with, uh, with these types of problems. And so at Blackbird, we've kind of boiled it down to um, five core signals, something we call the five signals framework um, that, uh, that uses artificial intelligence and, and network analysis uh, technologies to, to essentially create a, a risk engine uh, that could advise any team of analysts or any digital system as to where the most harmful content and risks are. And so these five signals we talk about um, we use AI to automatically generate um, and detect narratives. So these online storylines that form around a topic or an organization. Um, we look at networks, which help to visualize the evolving relationships and the concepts that they share. We look at coalitions, which I mentioned before. So detection through natural language processing um, to detect like-minded actors uh, and their communities of association, and which narratives they're driving through that network. Uh, so you can hear already that some of these signals are are kind of building up more resolution, narratives, networks, coalitions, and all of that helps you to understand which of those narratives are being manipulated. So manipulation, uh, distinguishing between authentic and inauthentic behavior, um, and finally influence. Um, out of all of this system, which actors, which narratives are having the most influence or, frankly, are the harmful actors or trusted voices within the network? Who are the nodes that shape the narrative? So the artificial solution we use is really looks across these five buckets. So again, they're narratives, networks, coalition, manipulation, and influence. We process all five of these signals through a high-speed risk engine to have much greater resolution on these new risks um, and basically piecemeal them out on dashboards or, you know, um, outputting into third party systems so that decisions can be made uh, knowing, I, I guess, for lack of a better way to put it, is, is knowing where your fires are, knowing where your battles of the day are that are actually high harm and um, are generated perhaps by either inauthentic or authentic sources um, to rapidly make decisions against. And without the ability to use artificial intelligence and technology to parse the just constant billions of, of posts and content that's coming out there, there's no way that you'd be able to be a, get, get a, a true operational picture of what's happening. Uh, in fact, most of these signals that we talk about um, in our five signals framework is, is totally missed um, by today's platforms that are primarily even the, the, the tech engines that are out there are using volume and sentiment as a proxy for harm. And manipulators can easily game those signals of trending uh, and negative positive sentiment to fool your systems and ultimately fool your decision makers. And who is at risk here? Is it all the companies in the world? Is it all the organizations, NGOs, government agencies? Is this risk the same for everyone? I think this disinformation uh, risk is kind of the umbrella problem and umbrella risk for all major organizations, governments, and individuals. I'll just give you an example here. Mm -hmm. So you know, I've always talked about, and even today, discussed how these techniques can be used to manipulate the public, manipulate the markets, et cetera. But you know, today's threat actors, they, they've got the option to hack infrastructure like they always have around corporate networks, voting machines, that's not really the most effective path anymore. Certainly not the, the most economically efficient path. The new communications and cyber threat isn't just infrastructure and hardware. The new threat surface is the individual, the perception of a single person, databases and networks. They don't need to be hacked and executives don't need to misstep 
for a threat actor to fabricate leaks and quotes and memos and then spread that rapidly. Voting machines, in fact, don't need to be hacked. You got to hack the voters. See doubt, sow confusion. That's the new approach. Insider trading, I mentioned before, why bother? Manipulate the market and short a stock since you know what's coming. Now, these attacks may come in parallel with traditional cyber attacks. That'll further amplify the situation. But my point here is, in order to, to safeguard your perimeter and make critical decisions, no matter which entity or, or kind of leader you are, you need a, this kind of information risk firewall in order to get this understanding of the landscape that we all exist in today. And, and, and frankly, those signals need to be embedded into every intelligence platform as a core guidance uh, system uh, before you actually deploy any kind of real strategy based on big data analytics or any of these things that companies have been amassing. Frankly, if you've amassed hundreds of millions or billions of dollars in big data, storing all that data, your insights coming from that, if they're not sophisticated, really aren't giving you what you need, right? And I guess the, the really wild part about this is governments and, and organizations have been very, very slow to become aware of this problem. And we're seeing some of the leading companies in the world now starting to take this seriously. We work with a number of them. But um, I think every company um, is going to need to think about this in 2022 and on. Otherwise, they're going to be really caught off guard uh, when some of these threats completely bypass all of the safeguards they've had in place. Now, of course, you're mentioning some very critical and serious problems uh, for many companies, agencies, NGOs. Can you just expand a little bit about what you mean by you know providing a firewall? Can you talk a little bit more about the countermeasures? Yeah, I always kind of think about this through the, the perspective of um, how fast you can detect the threat. And then the response is by and large very different depending on the type of customer or the type of sector that we work in. So one thing I, I preface by in just very transparent ways is that there's no easy button or easy fix for what is happening. So say an organization comes to us and they say, we just you know, kind of want you to click a button and make this all go away. Um, we're very clear that that's just not the way it works. Frankly, if something is out there, there's no delete button on social media, right? It's out there. So the, what we aim to do here is there's not a way to stop disinformation, right? There's, it's going to continue to escalate. It's about how you detect, how quickly you detect, and then how you make decisions um, to act or not react on um, the harm that is about to hit you or that has now hit you. So for us, if we're working with a PR and comms organization, let's say, well, in that sector, the customers are actually really good at uh, mitigating and responding to risk. For them, it's about understanding which risks are real and which ones are not. What is the degree and severity of the new harmful narrative or risk or information attack? And how can we get ahead of the curve on that before it starts to snowball, right? The Blackbird doesn't have an unwind button for that. Just like data analytics companies that measure trending and sentiment can't untrend or change sentiment, right? That's still um, going to be for some time in the purview of human analysts, teams, and strategic communicators, right? Um, you know, through that lens of strategic communication, our AI and technology certainly doesn't replace the, the human communication that needs to occur once you actually know what's happening in the landscape. The issue around information and operations today is that landscape, the certainty that these kind of linear playbooks that were created for communicators over the years, those kind of normalcies have gone out the window. And what we uh, you know, strive to achieve is creating that understanding again of that information space so that those decision makers and communicators and, and uh, you know, kind of mitigators can do the work, whether it's through the media, whether it's through uh, takedowns with social media and, and, and communicating with the platforms on, on what kind of, uh, you know, activity is occurring. Um, those are the kinds of things we help to empower. It's about showing them where their issues actually are 
and giving them an, an understanding around it. But none of this um, will go away, right? In fact, um, this is an, an arms race. And unfortunately, with every kind of arms race, you know, defense always trails offense, right? In any category you look at. Offense comes first, and that is what guides defense. And I think the, the key thing here is people need to start really focusing on these kind of defensive measures. And for defense, just more in point to your question, right now, today, it's about detection as early as possible and categorization of what kind of attacks are occurring. And going into 22 and 23, I can't get into too much detail on that. Um, at least here at Blackbird, we have a, a pretty solid research and development base on what we can do to use AI to actually automate responses, measure change, and things of that nature that can give um, our clients even more tools beyond the detection component. So it's an active area of research, and I think something that will become more and more important. But for today, you know, how do you even mitigate with humans if you can't measure or detect where the problem is? And that's where our focus is, kind of a step one and then step two approach to the bigger ecosystem challenges. Well, some Khaled, thanks so much for a very informative discussion. Thanks for joining the Stratcom podcast. Thank you for having me and, uh, and appreciate the work you all are doing.